going to talk about the Gospel of Matthew again. We're in chapter 12. We're going to be in verses 9 through 21. You may have heard of Amy Carmichael, famous missionary, uh, Irish missionary from last century. She dedicated her life to rescuing young girls from temple prostitution in India. One of them, named Prina, whose parents sold to the Hindu temple, escaped and eventually found uh, the Irish missionary who she called Amma, the word for mother in her native language. And under threats from the religious establishment of the time and place, Carmichael founded the Donovore Fellowship, an orphanage where she housed some 130 other girls who would have otherwise have turned into servants of the Devadasi, the Hindu priests, against their wishes, but instead came to know the love of God through a faithful servant of Christ. Amma, Amy Carmichael, reproduced the kindness of her Savior by demonstrating very clearly that human life is more important than religious tradition, which sometimes can be deadly. In the passage we're going to study today, we're going to meet some very devoted people to a particular religious system, but who demonstrate a very low view of human life because they show little interest in the needs of a fellow man. And by recording another interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees, Matthew then contrasts man-made religious traditions with divine kindness. That's very important for us to distinguish. Man-made religious traditions against divine kindness. Now, those of us who are born again, subjects of the kingdom of heaven, have the ability to display both. The hypocrisy of a man-made system and also divine kindness. One is the default reaction of our flesh and takes very little effort. Just follow your natural inclination. The other one requires the intervention from the Holy Spirit in a response from us. How many of you here know that you will never be accidentally kind? There's something we need to work at. And thankfully, those of us who have been born again, we are subjects of the kingdom of heaven. We have received the kindness of the King of Kings. Therefore, we can reproduce it to other people. And so I invite you to turn your Bibles to the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to read verses 9 through 21, and we're going to learn the kindness of of our Savior. And I'll ask a question right after I read this passage so that we can sort of try to answer that question in the way Jesus does here in the text. And Matthew says this, departing from there, he went into their synagogue and a man was there whose hand was withered. And they asked Jesus, oh, they questioned Jesus rather, asking, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? He said to them, what man is there among you who has a sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable, then, is a man than a sheep? So then, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored to normal like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. But Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him, and he healed them all and warned them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel not cr nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed he will not break off, in a, uh, a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory. And in his name the Gentiles will hope. Now when we read this interaction between Jesus and his foes, by the way the title of the sermon here is The Foes of the King. It's, we're going to take four Sundays to talk about the foes of the king and the lessons we draw from those interactions. But this particular one here, the first one of the series, prompts us to ask the following question. When is it time? When is it the right time to demonstrate Christ-like kindness? Because that's what Jesus is dealing with here with these guys. They're saying, today is not the day to demonstrate kindness. And Jesus says, no, no. Every day is the day to demonstrate kindness because I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Remember verse 8, he said that. So in order for us to answer that question, first I want you to look at me with, um, in verses 9 through 10, 
What Matthew gives us here is the analysis of human hypocrisy. The analysis of human hypocrisy because that's what uh, Jesus is confronting here. Every man-made religious system tends to place an unbalanced emphasis on tradition and compliance to rituals which vary from extremely legalistic like performing a number of prayers every day to appease some sort of deity to deadly like the atrocity of sati for example those of you who don't know what that is that's a Hindu ritual thankfully no longer practice partially due um, to the efforts of William Carey the father of modern-day missions that practice demanded the burning of a widow alive to honor the deceased husband many times against her wishes so those are religious practices that elevate the practice and diminish the value of human life now Matthew exp exposes the evil of a similar system here at the time of Christ remember the narrative moves Jesus from a field of grain to a synagogue to illustrate verse 8 which says you will remember Jesus proclaims the son of man is the lord of the sabbath now the healings on the jewish day of rest in this section here uh, sort of uh, unify the whole uh, scene but luke clarifies that the exchange takes place on a different sabbath not in the first one of the previous scene that's in luke 6 verses 6 through 11 and while in the previous scene the pharisees accused the disciples of christ this time they assault him Verbally speaking, they, they confront him. They accuse him of violating their silly, unbiblical rule. And according to the physician Luke, in Luke 6, verse 7, the Pharisees and the scribes watched him, not for the purpose of learning from him, but to find fault in him, which obviously they found none. But the other synoptic gospels, the first three gospels, clarify that Jesus called upon the man to come forward. So it's a, it's a very good exercise to read the same scene in the three synoptic gospels there to see how they harmonize. In this case here, he called the man um, forward, not because he wanted to embarrass him or expose him or anything, but because he wanted to raise a point. And he knew what the scribes and Pharisees were thinking. That's in Luke 6, verse 8. Again, Jesus displays omniscient. He knows what people think. He can read minds, and he knows what they were thinking, so he calls the man uh, to the front. Now, to confront this silly, unbiblical tradition that the Pharisees invented, and that tradition was this. And again, it added to scriptures. You were not allowed to perform a healing on the day of Sabbath unless that person you were trying to cure faces a life-threatening situation now obviously they didn't account for miraculous healing in this uh, law that they invented so again the law that they invented is if you're a medical doctor you could not treat someone on a sabbath unless that someone was facing a, a non-life-threatening emergency well in this case here this man didn't face a life-threatening situation his problem was with the withered hand and jesus purposefully then calls upon the man to raise the issue not because, again, he wanted to confront the Pharisees for the purpose of embarrassing them, but for the purpose of leading them to the truth, because obviously they didn't know the truth. So, and the, the problem for them is that they knew Jesus Christ uh, has supernatural powers, but they assigned those supernatural powers to demonic source. Re you can read that in chapter 12, verse 24. In uh, chapter 10, verse 25, Jesus recognizes that the scribes and Pharisees know that this man has supernatural powers. But they say, well, he's not from God. He's from the devil. Now, again, they started the gossip like that. But in his sovereignty, God allowed that man to be in that synagogue at that time to serve as a visual illustration of divine kindness. Someone receiving divine kindness on a day that, according to a religious tradition made by man, you are not supposed to display so we have here the kindness of Christ contrasted with human hypocrisy. And according to Matthew, the Pharisees asked Jesus a question. Again, not to clarify their misconception, not to learn from him, but to accuse him of breaking an unbiblical tradition, a silly and ridiculous lot that they made up for them, an unredeemable sin. According to them, obviously, so much so that they called for his destruction after this whole thing now but 
what's alarming here, church, is that we have religious people who care nothing about the predicament of a fellow human being. Did you catch that? We have here the self-proclaimed shepherds of Israel, the leaders of it, the religious leaders of that time, whose hearts are so out of alignment with the heart of God that they refuse to acknowledge that the man has a problem and the man needs a healing touch from Christ. Therefore, they prefer to accuse Christ of breaking a law that they made up that have no, has nothing to do with the Old Testament. For them, this man was nothing more than an opportunity to trap Jesus in his words rather than a fellow human being who needed healing. In church, religious hypocrisy always does that. It places tradition before tenderness, and it elevates ritual over relationship, liturgy over liberty, compliance over compassion, ceremony over conversion. These unbiblical systems here seek to, uh, to make devotees rather than disciples of Christ, and as a result, they cannot produce the new birth required for entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Remember, Jesus says, unless you are born again, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And obviously, these rules don't cause anything to be born again. Only the grace of God causes somebody to be born again. So obviously, these systems here, this hypocritical, man-made systems of religious uh, compliance know nothing about saving grace. Tragically, both leaders and followers in these performance-based religions stand condemned before God because they have not received salvation by grace through faith. They need our prayers. Like the Pharisees, they hate Jesus, but they're not our enemies. They are a mission field. They need to hear about the true gospel. And uh, they need to learn about the proper view of human life. And the only way to do that is to drive them to scriptures so that they can learn that it is always the appropriate time to demonstrate kindness to someone. It is always the right time to demonstrate Christ-like compassion to others, even though we can't perform miracles. But we can. We are able to demonstrate kindness. So let's continue here with the passage. After looking at the analysis of human hypocrisy according to the format of the text, in order to answer that question that I posed in the beginning, in the beginning when is the right time to demonstrate kindness? And obviously Jesus raises that question. Let's look now at point number two, the application of divine mercy. Because that is what Matthew is describing here, how divine mercy is applied. After he made a short analysis of human hypocrisy, he demonstrates to us here the application of divine mercy. Verses 11 through 14. Now, members of the heavenly kingdom, you and I, uh, born-again believers, should be known for a high view of human life. Because that is God's perspective. Okay, people are made in the image of God. They're not objects like these guys in the scene here were considering that man to be. They care nothing about the guy. They care more about the legality of Jesus performing a miracle or performing a healing rather than this is a man who needs assistance. Now, those of us who are born again believers, we claim to be followers of Christ. We therefore need to have the same view, view of human life than he does which results in the application of the divine virtue of mercy. Remember Beatitude number five in Matthew five verse seven. Blessed are the merciful. So church, it's not that we enter the kingdom of heaven because we are merciful. No, we only enter the kingdom of heaven because of the grace of God. But because we are in the kingdom, we are therefore able to reproduce the mercy that has been given to us, to other people. So, and the only way to apply mercy is between people to people. God doesn't need our mercy. We need his mercy. In fact, the difference between grace and mercy is this. Grace is when God um, doesn't give us what we deserve. I mean, it gives us what we don't deserve. And mercy is when it withholds from us what we deserve, and that's judgment. So, Jesus Christ is granting this man here divine mercies that's applying to him and saying, you are a sinner, but let me give you the healing touch so for that reason church we out of everybody should be slow to pass judgment and quick to grant the benefit of the doubt always we should be slow to assume wrong motives and quick to assign best intentions but we see nothing of that going on here in these religious folks of verse 10 they did not demonstrate any of those virtues in fact mark points out that jesus experienced anger and grief 
Jesus was angry, and he was grieved in his heart with them. That's in Mark 3, verse 5. Not because they were accusing him. See, what caused Jesus' anger and grief is not the fact that they were opposing him, but the fact that their hearts were so hardened about the needs of a fellow human being that they were more concerned about keeping a religious tradition that never even came from God in the first place. So he answers their challenge with a short parable fitting for the good shepherd. It's not by coincidence that he uses the illustration of sheep falling into a pit here in this short parable that he gives. Why? Because he is the good shepherd. Now, consistent with every false religion invented since then, the self-proclaimed shepherds of Israel had a low view of human life and an exaggerated view of tradition. That is a common feature of every man-made religion in the world, and that is every religion except biblical Christianity. A high view of tradition and a low view of human life. Now, a brand new believer expressed that view to me one time. This was years ago. Uh, he had recently come out of Islam a few years before. He came to me for counseling because he was furious with his sister who had also become a Christian not too long ago, but she was pregnant by her Muslim husband. And instead of rejoicing with the new life, this man referred to that baby as, quote, a little devil who should be aborted, close quote. See, in his mind, that unborn child contained a seed of an evil religion. So I walked him through uh, the passages of Scripture that describe people as image bearers of God and that describe that children are a gift from the Lord and that, no, that baby should never be aborted. That baby should be allowed to live. And I, he, I, we made progress. I got him to promise me that he would pray for the baby, pray for the mother, and pray for the conversion of the father. I told him, you came out of Islam. You go to that guy and tell him about the fact that he's in a false religion, that he needs to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Instead of considering that little baby uh, uh, a devil who needed to be aborted, you shower that child with kindness. Now Christ points out this type of hypocrisy here. The Pharisees, listen to this church, the Pharisees would violate their own man-made religious system to show mercy to an animal, a source of profit. That's what Jesus says. What man among you would not go and try to rescue a sheep who fell into a pit. An animal, in that, in the sheep was a source of, of, of profit in that time. But they cared very little about the predicament of their fellow human being. And they have demonstrated that over and over again. Um, but the, the type of burdens that they placed on people, which prompted, by the way, Jesus to invite everybody in Matthew 11, verses 20 to 30, come to me. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Church, why is he come inviting people to come to him? Because he was dealing with people who were overburdened by the pressures of a false religious system that imposed uh, laws on people that God never intended to impose. In fact, here's... Uh, some harsh words from Christ to the scribes, the lawyers of the time, the religious slash lawyers of the time. Luke 11 verse 46, it says this, Woe to you, lawyers as well, for you ate men down with your burdens hard to bear, while you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. So Jesus, again, deals with the matter head on. He says, you are hypocrites because you require that of people and something that God never intended and you don't even do them. That's why he says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. Now, church, if you think our sophisticated, enlightened, postmodern culture is any different than that, think again and reconsider the relevance of the Bible. I'll tell you, the Bible is more relevant than today's newspaper. And here's why, another reason why. In the United States, you will pay around $100,000 of fine and face possible jail time if you kill a bald eagle. But it won't cost you anything to have the, your baby in your womb murdered. By the way, 
the federal government will gladly pay for that and it will be hailed as a progressive person. The only thing they don't tell you is the, th the emotional and the spiritual consequences of that. Now, if we need a clearer definition of God's position about human life, other than Jesus' imagery of sheep and shepherd here, consider the words of Christ that we studied not too long ago, chapter 10, verses 29 to 31. Are two sparrows not sold for an Assyrian? And yet, not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not fear. You are more valuable than a great number of sparrows. So church here, the picture is very clear. People are more important than animals. And what Christ is doing here by, pro by proposing that parable, short parable to the Pharisees who were condemning him for extending grace and kindness to a man is this. You are able to grant kindness to an animal that is, yes, a valuable creature, but in according to the a scale of importance here. People are made in the image of God. Are you, you are more valuable than a number of sparrows. Church or friend, you are not an evolved ape. Did you know that? Rather than resulting from a series of evolutionary accidents, your life bears the image of God, whether you're Christian or not. Atheists even have the image of God and they have therefore intrinsic value because they were created in the image of God. And as someone made in the image of God, who obviously that image is uh, blurred because of sin, you have needs. And Jesus stands ready to meet those needs, whether they stand in the way of religious tradition or not. And that's the point that he wants, to, wants us to know here. You have needs that he stands ready to meet. Maybe not all your wants, but every one of your needs he will meet even if those needs stand in the way of religious ceremonies. And by the way, according to Scripture, what is man's greatest need, church? Come on, you know that. What is man's greatest need? To be born again. That is more important than having food in your belly. That is more important than having clothes to wear. Is to make sure you, be made, you are made right with God. See, our job as a Christian is not to make the world a better place for people to go to hell from. Our job as a Christian is to proclaim salvation by grace through faith and let God take care of changing the world. Obviously, we're going to, by demonstrating kindness and, and by demonstrating Christ-like compassion, the world will be a better place. But our primary job is to make sure that people know about Jesus Christ. Don't miss the imagery here that Jesus gives Jesus' critics, along with everybody else in the world, are the sheep in need of rescuing. That he says here, what man among you will not stop everything you're doing on a Sabbath and rescue the sheep that fell into the pit? Church, we are the fallen people who fell into the pit called sin. And as a result, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's in Romans 3, verse 23. But here's the good news. The Father spared no effort to go and, sh and rescue those sheep who fell into the pit called sin because he so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. You see, we cannot crawl our way out of that pit by our own efforts. You cannot earn your way out of that pit. It has to be a work of God. And Jesus is using that illustration on purpose so that we can understand that people are valuable to him so much so that he spared not even his only son to die on a cross to rescue people so that um, we can have eternal life. Those of us who believe in Christ. So church, God considers you worth saving. For that reason, as believers in Christ, as members of the kingdom of heaven, we should prioritize saving souls from hell before we want to save dolphins from fishing nets or turtles from plastic straws. Is that clear? People are more important. Now Isaiah puts it this way, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. 
Isaiah 53, 6. Paul puts it this way, I, uh, Romans 5, verse 8. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So again, church, God did not spare his own son to redeem sinners. We should not allow religious traditions to get in the way of our compassion so that he can continue to do the job of rescuing sinners from the pit of condemnation. We don't take a day off from being Christ-like. We don't take a day off from extending mercy and grace and telling people how they can be saved. It was motivated by Christ-like love that Amy Carmichael rescued little girls from temple prostitution in India. She gave her life to that cause. It was motivated by Christ-like kindness that William Carey fought for the end of widow burning in India. He's the father of modern-day missions, um, a British guy. Look at verse 12 again and answer with me, church. When is the right time to demonstrate Christ-like kindness? Now. Now is the time. Yesterday, tomorrow, Sunday only? No. Every day except Sunday because we're in church? No. When you feel like it? No. When people earn your kindness? No, because you didn't have to earn God's kindness. It was given to you by His grace. Now you extend that same grace to others. We fix our eyes on Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith, according to Hebrews 12, verse 2. And to prove his point, this is what he did. He healed the man from a non-life-threatening condition on the Sabbath, the Jewish day of rest, and he infuriated his opponents because of that. The point is, he violated some pharisaical, ridiculous, silly rule, which has nothing to do with the Bible, but he did not violate any rule from God. In fact, he did the work of God. He is the Lord of the Sabbath, church. According to verse 8, he is the one who regulates what happens on the Sabbath. And he says in verse 12, it is good, it is okay to do good on the Sabbath. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And for that, we can obviously come to the conclusion that every day is day to do good. Every day is the day to demonstrate kindness to someone. So if, if you've been holding on, if you're withholding kindness from someone, stop that. Today, this afternoon, demonstrate kindness to someone. Now, if you need further proof from God, if you need, still wonder how God would answer that question that we asked in the beginning, and it's in your notes there. Uh, when is the right time to, to, to be good or to, to not to be good because we're never good. When is the right time to do good, to extend kindness? Here's what the Word of God says. Galatians 6 verse 9, let us not lose heart. In doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So church, Scripture encourages us to always do good. Let us not lose heart. In other words, let's keep doing that. That's why we need to be reminded from the Word of God because our natural tendency is to not do good to people, is to not be kind. You will never accidentally be kind to someone. You will be rude. You will be uh, bitter. You will express resentment always instead of uh, naturally unless you make a, a determination in your heart that you want to follow what Scripture says. And those of us who are followers of Christ, those of us who are born again, members of the kingdom of heaven, we have the best example of all, the kindness of our Savior who died for us, who rescued us from that pit called sin. Now, obviously, I can't perform any miracles, neither can you. So we can't heal someone miraculously like Jesus did, despite what you see on TV. Okay? You can't heal anybody miraculously. But what you can do is this. You can do something that is within your ability. For example, do you know someone who lost a job during the pandemic? Well, can you help? Pay the rent this month? Can you buy groceries? Do you know someone who wants to come to church but doesn't have transportation? Could you provide transportation or you say, nope, it's my Sunday, it's my day of rest? No. Do you know someone who needs a word of encouragement? Do you know any couple who could use free babysitting so that they could go, go on a date? And by the way, I'm not, this is not a, a, a request because my daughter is already old enough. <laughs> she doesn't need babysitting. Let's leave the miraculous up to God. How about that? 
Okay, and let's do what we can to demonstrate Christ-like kindness. Sacrifice your day of rest, church, and watch God fill your heart with joy, the joy of the Lord, which transcends all understanding. I will never forget the words of a fellow pastor to me one time. My wife and I were looking, we're in between houses, we're looking for a house uh, to go and uh, the place where we were, uh, you know, the, the close before the time, you, you know how that, those things go. So when we needed a place to stay momentarily, he came to us and said, you can stay at my house. And when I sat down to him, with him to sort of, okay, I'll, I'll pay you rent, utilities and all of that, and he, he said something I'll never forget. He said this, quote, brother, stay at my house as long as you need and pay me nothing. Don't take that joy from me. Close quote. I'll never forget. And I've tried to reproduce that ever since. Now the scribes and Pharisees, look at verse 14. How that whole thing ended. How that discussion, very short discussion ended. The Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. Now they've determined in their hearts that Jesus uh, deserved to die for breaking their silly law. And because also they believe his power came from Satan again. We will see that next week, but if you look at verse 24, they say, well, he, he does all of these things by the power of Satan. So they determined that he deserved to die. But the problem for them was this. They couldn't execute Christ because Rome had a law that says no one else can crucify people other than Roman people, Roman soldiers. So their predicament, their dilemma was we need to plot something. We need to come up with a plan to destroy Christ. But what we're going to see here in the next point is the appreciation for scriptural clarity because we're going to see here that that is within God's plan. They thought that they came up with a great plan and what we see here is that God was way ahead of them because he knew from the foundation of the world that he needed to slay his own son in order to redeem sinners. So after we looked at the analysis of human hypocrisy in this text, the application of divine mercy... In order to answer that question that we asked in the beginning, we're going to look at the appreciation for scriptural clarity. And I want you to see um, the perfect clarity from the Word of God, the harmony between two testaments here and some other lessons we will learn here. Verses 15 through 21. Because what Matthew is doing, he is quoting from the Old Testament. Now, the, as the Lord of the Sabbath and one with the Father, Jesus possesses the divine attribute of omniscience, Okay? That is to say he knows all things. Now, only God has that attribute. I know some of you may think you do, but it's only God that has omniscience. Okay, He's all wise and he knows reality as well as potentiality. Think about that. He knows everything that happened in the past, everything that will happen in the future, and everything that would have happened if you, you had taken a different course of action. That's divine omniscience. The Bible says Jesus knows what's in their hearts. Jesus knows exactly what they're thinking. It's not because somebody gave him the heads up. No, it's because of divine omniscience. He reads people's minds. But beyond that, when the Bible says here uh, he was aware of this, it's not, because of, not only because of divine omniscience, but because Jesus was already prepared to fulfill God's redemptive plan. That's the reason he came to the earth, to die on a cross, to redeem sinners. So he knew that even though these people were planning to destroy him, he thought, well, nothing new here. I already know that I'm going to die at the hands of sinful men, for sinful men. He knew that redemption required him to die on a cross by the betrayal of his own people. Read the first chapter of the book of John. It says there that he came to his own, but his own received him not. Talking about the Jewish people who rejected him and we saw this here in this particular text, the beginning of that, the religious people of Israel of that day, the shepherds, the self-appointed shepherds who represented the national unity of the country, rejected him. And we will see that plan, that the plot that they have developed uh, play out all the way to the end of the book. But again, in their minds, they concocted this Great plan to execute Christ, but in the mind of God, no, you're just being an instrument in my own hands. Again, Matthew is not doing a word-for-word -word quote of an, uh, uh, the passage in Isaiah. By the way, that passage is Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4, if you want to write that down. And um, before, uh, it, this is not a word-for-word -word quote, and it's known as the suffering servant passage. 
Now, Matthew is explaining, so the Bible explains the Bible. Don't you love it when that happens, when the Bible explains the Bible? So Matthew is giving us the explanation of that passage in Isaiah. But um, before we even get to that, listen to verse 15 again. Jesus withdrew from there. Many followed him, and he healed them all, and he warned them not to tell who he was. Stop right there. Many people ask at this point, why? Why is he doing that? And you will be surprised at how much you will know if you just keep reading. <laughs> because verse 17 answers that question. Why in the world would Jesus tell people to not tell everyone who doesn't he, isn't he all about announcing the kingdom? Doesn't, hasn't he come here to proclaim the kingdom and he's telling people not to tell who he was? Listen to verse 17. The purpose is this was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah. So the purpose of Jesus doing what he did was to fulfill Old Testament prophecy, which Matthew explains what this is all about. And I want you to pay attention here to verse 18. He shall proclaim justice to the nations or to the Gentiles. So church, the purpose of God is that Israel would have rejected Christ so that he can proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles as well. The disciples did that. They proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. And you can thank God for that because those of us who are Gentiles, non-Jews, have come to Christ because of God's divine plan. Now, the Pharisees, again, may have thought that this was all their idea. But let me clarify something to you here from the Word of God. Again, from the book of Isaiah. They thought that they were the ones who provoked or to cause Jesus to die. But it was the Lord who was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hands. That's Isaiah 53, verse 10. So did you catch that, church? Men didn't kill Jesus, really. They, obviously, they used their, their hands to do that, but it was God. It was the Lord who was pleased to crush him. The Bible says it was a divine plan from the beginning that the Father would crush the Son so that you and I wouldn't be crushed forever. See, even the opponents of the gospel serve God's sovereign purposes when they think they are causing harm. And of course, God will hold each of them accountable. But let me ask you again, church, who killed Jesus Christ? Before you answer this question, let me read you some more Bible verses. And you might want to write them down so that we can appreciate scriptural clarity here. Romans 8, verse 32. He, meaning God, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? So according to the Bible, church, God the Father did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all for the purpose of giving us all things those of us who place our faith in Jesus Christ. He did not spare his son so that he would spare your life from eternal punishment. And again, we ask, whose minds plan the death of Christ? Because the Pharisees thought that they were planning the whole thing. Peter helps us answer that question in Acts 2, verse 23, in his famous sermon. He said this, This man, meaning Christ, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Did you catch that? By the predetermined plan of foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. So who killed Jesus? God the Father. How did he do it? By the hands of godless man. Why? To give us eternal life. Because otherwise we would still be in the pit of sin. The good shepherd stops everything to go rescue sinners from their life of sin, and that's you and me. Something else here that we learn, church. Did Christ resist the Father's predetermined plan? No. Did he fire back at the Pharisees who wanted him dead? Well, he could have said, oh, yeah, you're going to plan to kill me? I know what you're thinking. I'm going to just say the word and you're going to be zapped. Did he do that? No. Why? He just withdrew from the area. Why? Because he had people to save. He had more important things to accomplish than to engage in an argument, in, in a debate with these guys. He continued his ministry until the appointed time of his crucifixion which, by the way, he endured voluntarily. In case you didn't know that, this is what he says in John 10, verses 17 through 18. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. 
No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. So Jesus voluntarily went to the cross so that he would save you and me from sin. And he endured the cross, obviously, with agony in his heart. But for the joy set before him, according to the author of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 2. Therefore, church, according to Matthew, the suffering servant passage, that's Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4 here, reveals much about the character of Christ. He's gentle in heart. He's humble. He's not going to quarrel. He's not going to cry out. He's not going to argue because he's gentle and humble in heart. He does nothing to defend himself. That is That jumps out from this text here, that Jesus did nothing. He's not running from these guys, by the way. He's not, he withdrew from there, not to run, but he withdrew from there because he had a mission to accomplish. So he didn't do anything to defend himself or to uncover the plot to get him crucified because he had people to reach, because he had work to do. He had plenty of good to accomplish on the Sabbath and on the other days of the week as well. Why, church? Because every day is the right time to demonstrate Christ-like kindness. And what a lesson for us. What a precious lesson for us this morning, church. Friend, be, go, be of good cheer when you face opposition for doing the Lord's work. And by the way, you will face opposition when you do the Lord's work. It's not whether you will face opposition or not. If you will face opposition when you do God's work. Just like the Pharisees did to Jesus, people will second guess you. They will criticize your motives. They will oppose you because of your compassion for lost souls. It's biblical. They oppose Christ because Christ had compassion on this poor fellow. People will oppose you because you demonstrate compassion for people. That is to expect. We, we, we need to expect that. They, they will say you're violating some sort of ridiculous set of rules that they've invented. They may even plot to take you down. But what do you do? Continue to do what God has called you to do. Faithfully. Silently if need to. Do nothing to defend yourself. Open your mouth to defend the gospel, not yourself. Until God calls you home. In fact, I'll never forget these words that I heard from another pastor. You might want to write these down because they're profound. He said this, be faithful. Die, be forgotten. Be faithful. Fulfill your ministry. Die and be forgotten. Let God take care of your legacy. <laughs> that's so encouraging. And that's what Jesus uh, is doing here. Obviously, he's not going to die and be forgotten because he rose again. The point is, based on the example of Jesus, in the exchange with the opponents of the gospel here, church, I ask you, and I actually need an audible answer this time. When is the right time to demonstrate Christ-like compassion? No! No! Today, this afternoon, don't wait. Make the phone call this afternoon. Call someone who can use a word of encouragement. Call someone and say, hey, friend, I've been praying for you. I just want to catch up with you. Everything you're doing okay? Hey, I just wanted to know I love you and I care about you. And I, you know, if there's anything I can do for you, but if not, I can always pray for you. By the way, have I ever told you about my faith in Jesus Christ, about the hope that I have of eternal life? Let me ask you a question. Do you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? Or is this something you're still trying to determine? Because if not, if you are, I have good news for you. And give them the gospel. Church, can you think of anything kinder than to lead someone to Christ? Now, you may cross an ocean to rescue young girls from table prostitution and introduce them to the one who will never sell them. Or you can leave the comfort of America and face certain martyrdom in, in some other part of the world for the cause of Christ. And by the way, you have a very comfortable life. Did you know that? Those of us who are Americans, take it from the man who grew up in a third world country. You have a very comfortable life. You, you, God may be calling you to give up all that comfort to go to some hostile place and preach Christ, but let me give you some good news. And you don't even have to learn a new language. The United States has really never been a Christian nation. Did you know that? Because the Bible says there is no such thing as a Christian country. There is no such thing. There's a Christian people, 
The holy nation that 1 Peter 2 verse 9 talks about is the people of God's own possession from all tribe, tribes and, tongue and uh, tongues and every nation, a royal priesthood, subjects of the kingdom of heaven from every language, a tribe and tongue who are still on this earth for the purpose of proclaiming the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So, by the way, we live in one of the most ungodly countries in the world, in case you're looking for a mission field. I'll never forget the sign that I purchased one time years ago for the, my first pastoral assignment down in San Diego. It was the Brazilian church, and we had a sign at the door. It was all written in Portuguese so that everybody there could, wouldn't miss it. It says this, right at the end, a, at the door, when, after people shook my hand, they would face that sign head on. It says this, you are now entering the mission field. Now, we're not going to put a sign here, but I want you to remember these words. Right after you shake my hand or, or we exchange pleasantries at the end, I want you to know you are entering the mission field. There are people out there who need the kindness of God. They're not going to get it unless it's from you because the world out there is not a very friendly place. You have the kindness of Christ that has been given to you because you have been saved. And you are now able to express that kindness to someone. Find a believer in Christ and encourage that believer in Christ. Tell him you're praying for him. Find a non-believer in Christ and do the most, the, 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 the kindest act you can do and give them Jesus Christ. Because that's the reason you're still here. God could have taken you to heaven as soon as you got saved. He didn't because you got work to do here. You will be criticized. You will be second-guessed. You will face opposition. Continue to do what God's called you to do. Pay no attention to that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the kindness of Christ who has been given to us, Lord, as our Savior. And those of us who are members of this, the kingdom of heaven now, we have received so great a salvation, Lord, and you have commissioned us to go and proclaim that same salvation to others. Lord, teach us to be kind enough to tell others about Christ because someone was kind to us to tell us the gospel. And we believed, not because we have this great faith, but because you caused us to be born again. So thank you, Lord, for that. And we pray, Father, that you will raise up, even in our own midst here at Grace Baptist Church, an army of people who are committed to that, Lord, to the kindness uh, of God, to, to, to being, uh, extending compassion to people outside, Lord, and to the people inside as well. We need to be compassionate with one another, Lord. Obviously, we can't perform any miracles, but we can tell people we're praying for them and mean it. We can tell people that God loves them so much that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So, Lord, help us never deviate from that message, Lord. It's so tempting these days to get political, tempting to get polarized and to take up a cause that is not biblical, Lord, Take up a cause that has nothing to do with eternal consequences, Father. Please help us never fall into that temptation, Lord, and help us remember that we were in that pit of sin, and you rescued us, Lord, and you are still in the business of rescuing people, Lord, and they will not know unless they hear, and they will not hear unless we go out and preach and tell them the good news, Lord. So give us a renewed sense of compassion and commitment to that cause, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.